So I've shown you why you would make a pulse generator to interact with logic gates to make sure that the inputs and outputs and everything are stable before anything happens. And I've showed you how you might do it using a delay gate. But there's plenty of other ways to do it. And one way which I think is a good bit cleaner, at least in my opinion, is something called a monostable multivibrator. Recall that a multivibrator is something that goes between different states and monostable indicates one stable state, bistable indicates two, and astable means no stable states. So a bistable with two stable states would be a flip-flop. It goes high or low as an output. Astable would be the oscillator we made, and monostable is something that has only one stable state. You can kick it out of its stable state, and it'll go back into it automatically. And we can make a pulse generator out of a clock signal with this. Now, one thing, I tried to make this with BJTs, and it just doesn't work, because BJT logic gates have the resistors and they have base emitter current and feedback and it just doesn't work. All the feedback and everything messes with the circuit. So I have to use CMOS, which is why I just did the CMOS videos. So here we go. So let's say we have a trigger signal. We'll call it T and I'll say T naught. We're going to give it a high for off and a low for on. So I'll hook up a NAND gate, a capacitor, an inverter, and a resistor. Fairly simple circuit. The trigger is one of the inputs to the NAND. The NAND connects to the capacitor and to the inverter, and the inverter comes back around as the other input to the NAND. So there's our feedback. And once again, use CMOS for this. You can use a CMOS NAND and a CMOS NOT, or you can use two NANDs, because an inverter is just a NAND with both inputs the same. So you can use one NAND chip to do it. The resistor connects out like that, and of course, the resistor is connected through to our negative. And remember that implied in the logic gates are connections to positive and negative. It's just we don't bother drawing the pins because of course it is. So you would just connect your VCC or VSS, VDD, and ground to your CMOS NAND chip. And this does work with discrete MOSFETs. I have created some CMOS NAND gates in a breadboard just to test this out because I don't have a CMOS NAND chip right now. It's in a pile of something somewhere. But you'd only do that for testing, not... You wouldn't actually do that. You would just get a CMOS chip. So anyway, what happens? The output of this inverter, I suppose I should put that in. This is Q0, Q being our output. So the NOT indicates to have an idle, have it off, we give it a high. To activate it, we go low. And when it's idle, it's outputting a high. And when it's active, it's outputting a low. So what we have here is an RC network, resistor capacitor network. And you know, there's a time constant associated with that. Because we're using CMOS, there is no appreciable current into this gate. So this part doesn't really affect the RC network. You know, a tiny bit when the the gate on the MOSFET is charging and discharging, but not much, barely anything. And then here, you're just getting a clean connection to positive or negative with no resistor. With a BJT, you'd need a resistor, which would affect the resistance. But in this case, it's just connecting straight through to positive or negative. So because we use MOSFETs, this is a pure RC network. And a rough approximation of the timing of this circuit is 0.69 times R times C. Again, this is an approximation. If you need more precise timing, you'll want to mess around with it a bit. But basically, this is going to be the length of the pulse. You change the capacitor and resistor size to change the length of a pulse. So our input, let's say we have our input is high and then low and then high. So again, when it's idle, the output is going to be high. And then when the input goes low, the output will also go low for a limited amount of time. This amount of time is roughly this, and then it'll go back up. Not in a perfect square wave, it'll be curvy, but we're doing logic here, so we're just using thresholds. This represents after you, this, this represents the logic level, not the capacitor charging curve. So we're taking what we could have a square wave and do a pulse. It doesn't have to be a square wave, you can do single pulses. It's just you pulse it low, and you'll get a shorter pulse out of it based on this timing. Now one caveat to this, and I'll explain the circuit later, hold on, but right now I'm just showing you how it works. 
One caveat to this is the capacitor charging and discharging is what changes the output level. So this pulse, when it goes low, when it activates, has to be longer than the RC network time. And when it goes high and relaxes, that also has to be longer than the RC network time. Because if you do not let this capacitor, again, I'll show you in a minute, but if you do not let this capacitor fully charge and discharge, then you're not going to get these nice clean pulses. It's meant to take a long pulse and turn it into a short pulse. So that limits the applications of the circuit, but it works just perfectly fine for a pulse generator because that's what we have. We have a clock signal that we have longer pulses, a long low, a long high back and forth, and we want to take a low pulse. So it'll have plenty of time to relax. So you just take your this and again tweak it and make sure that half of the clock signal is greater than this by a reasonable margin. So what's actually going on here? Well, like I said, this is a monostable circuit, which means it has one single stable state. That stable state is when you're not activating it, so that's high, so that's off. Your output is going to be high. Now, what does that mean? If your output is high, this feedback, this is also high, right? I'm describing the stable state first. So your input is high, your output is high. The feedback is therefore going to be high, which means this is going to give a low output because it's NAND. High and high means low out of an NAND. So this capacitor has low on this side. And then here you can see there's low connected through this resistor to this side of the capacitor. So that's always low anyway. So you can see you've got low and low here, which means that if the capacitor wasn't discharged, it is discharged now. But in the stable state, the capacitor is discharged with the same voltage on both sides. So that means that there's no current flow through the capacitor. So you've just got your negative through this resistor connected into this inverter. So it's got low here, it inverts it to high, and there's your feedback. So that's the stable state. Now the idea is, no matter what you do to this circuit, in terms of changing inputs or outputs, no matter how you kick it out of its stable state, it'll go back in. For example, let's say you change your input to a low. Well, now the NAND is going to put out a high because the only time it puts out a low is when both are high. So this has changed to high. But nothing else happens yet because the capacitor is discharged. There's no current through it. So everything else is just connected the same way. But the capacitor starts to charge. It's got high on the left and low on the right. So it starts charging this way. So now what you have is you have a high current to this resistor, which means the resistor has a voltage drop. Now, when the capacitor is beginning to charge, the capacitor has no voltage drop across it. The maximum charging current is going through the resistor. So the resistor has all the voltage drop. As the capacitor charges, it starts charging more slowly, less current, again, quote unquote, through it, in a high level model through it, which means the voltage drop across the resistor gets smaller and smaller because the voltage drop across the capacitor is getting bigger and bigger as it charges and it charges more slowly. So it's resisting the flow of current. But at the beginning, it's charging super fast. So this resistor being the only other part of the circuit because we've got the output is high, so we've got high, but no resistors or anything other than wires. So high through a capacitor, which currently has zero voltage drop, through a resistor to negative. So the resistor has all of the voltage drop, which means this is actually getting a high instead. And it's low down here, which means this inverter switches and you get a low out of the inverter, which makes your output low and the feedback over here becomes low. But that's fine because this NAND is still going to put out a high. So now we've kicked it out of its stable state. So let's leave it alone for a second. We'll just keep giving it a low. So the capacitor charges and the voltage drop starts low and gets bigger and bigger and bigger because eventually the voltage drop is going to be high to low, the full voltage, because the capacitor will stop charging. It won't let voltage through or it won't let current through, so it'll conceptually have the full voltage drop. So with no current going through here, because again, we're using CMOS. This is why when I used BJT, it failed because there was still base current going into this gate. But with CMOS, there's not. Once the gate is charged to high, there's no more current going through here, microamps, nanoamps, whatever, but effectively no current. So you've got a high voltage drop across this capacitor and the resistor has lost its voltage drop because there's no more charging going on. The high to low is no more charging. So the voltage drop has stopped. And in fact, it's basically gotten to a threshold where the CMOS considers it a low. It doesn't have to be exactly zero, but at whatever point this voltage drop gets small enough 
because this voltage drop gets big enough to make this effectively a low instead, logically low, then the inverter is now putting out a high, which means the output has gone back to high, which means the feedback has gone back to high, which doesn't change what this NAND gate is doing. The NAND gate is still putting out a high, the input's still low, but the output has gone back to high while the input pulse is still low. So we've got our long clock signal is still low, but the pulse has come and gone based on the time here. That's why this time has to be shorter. The clock pulse has to be longer than this so that the charging time of this capacitor is shorter so it's a pulse. So it's gone back to its stable state. We're giving it a different input still, but it's gone back to its stable state with this high output. So what happens when we change the input back to high? Well, this is getting a high and a high, which means the NAND is putting out a low. So the capacitor is charged. The capacitor is charged this way. Because when you charge a capacitor, it acts like a resistor. When you discharge a capacitor, it acts like a voltage source, like a battery. So now we've got low on the left and low on the right of the capacitor. And the capacitor begins to discharge. So it has effectively a negative voltage drop. This resistor is having current go through it this way, which means it's a negative voltage drop according to this, because it's going backwards, remember? The current is coming out of this ground spot through the resistor, through the capacitor, quote unquote through, and into the CMOS gate and out its connection to negative and circling around. The electrons that piled up on one side, in fact this side, the electrons that piled up on this side are hitting back out here, circling around conceptually, and getting back on this side. They're just trading sides. So electron flow this way, conventional current this way. When we had high connected, don't get confused by the negative voltage. We had high through the capacitor, out the resistor, and out, which meant the voltage drop was in this direction, so it was high here. But now we've got the resistor, it's going this way and out around, so it's just the opposite direction. The voltage drop is negative, so definitely still low. So while the capacitor is discharging, this resistor has a negative voltage drop. And so even though this is different, this output is different, you're still getting a low over here into this inverter, which means it's still putting out high, which means it's still in its stable state of output high. And then eventually the capacitor will fully discharge, low on left, low on right, and we are back to where we started. That is how it generates pulses. And you can see now, again, the low pulse has to be longer than this, but the high pulse has to be longer as well, because if it's giving low, 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 low pulses before this thing can recover, then you get a goofy, maybe sawtooth or something, I don't know. But you have to give it time on the low pulse to fully charge through this and go back to high while the low is still there to make a pulse from a longer signal. And then when the pulse lets go, you have to, when the input pulse lets go, when the input lets go, you have to not give it another low input until it's fully discharged again. So when you're using a clock signal, it's gonna be half and half and it's always gonna be fine as long as half the clock is greater than that. So this is really what this is for. You can use it as a one shot with a nice 555 timer or whatever, but this is designed specifically for taking a clock signal and turning it into pulses. And it's falling edge pulses because the clock is high and it goes low and you get a pulse every time the clock goes low. So it generates falling edge pulses on your clock that you can use in your logic. And if you need high instead of low or whatever, then just stick an inverter on the output. Inverter on the input, whatever you want to do, you can always use inverters, they're fun. Now what about when the circuit powers on? Well, just like the A-stable multivibrator oscillator, when you first apply power, recall how the CMOS gates, you'd get uh, high output, low output, and whatever? Because if the, if the PMOS on the top was on, you'd get a high as your output. And if the NMOS on the bottom was on, you'd get a low. Well, when you first power it on, the CMOS gate, it's floating output. There's nothing connected yet. Neither, none of the P's or the N's are conducting yet. So you don't have a connection to positive or negative. So basically, whatever input signals you're giving it, both of these CMOS gates are basically trying to turn on. They're connected to ground, so they're they're not floating inputs. You know, this this basically acts as a pull down resistor, if you look at it. When, when this is giving you a floating output, nothing's happening, when this is blocked off, this is a pull down resistor, making sure the input of this is grounded. So this is going to try and put out a high, and then, if you're giving this a high, so forth. But basically, quantum mechanical effects, the temperature on one side of the chip versus the other, blah, 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 
One of these is going to win. Something is going to happen. The circuit is going to settle into some state, you know, that we recognize as it's in a state now. But because it's the mono stable, it has only one stable state, whatever it powers up as, whatever, whatever goofy state it powers up in, it's going to settle because you're going to give it a high because, you know, you have to wire it up correctly. So you're using it properly. You're going to give it a high input, which means that eventually it will settle, you know, after nanoseconds, microseconds, whatever. Whatever it ended up in, it'll settle. The capacitor will discharge. All these gates will be proper and you'll get your high output. So during the boot up of a circuit, you might, like, if you have one part of a circuit relies on the next part of the circuit. Like, for example, in a MacBook, I watched a Lewis Rossman video, if you have a system manager controller, system management controller, that relies on a power, a linear power regulator, or a power regulator, and the management controller is going to goof up if it doesn't have exactly the level of power it wants, there's actually a little timer that prevents the management controller from starting at all for a certain amount of time. So the power regulator can settle, and then the timer expires and the management controller boots up. So you actually have a boot sequence inside your circuit where one thing relies on the other so you boot up one thing you wait a moment by disabling keeping something else disabled with a pull down or pull up resistor until you can give it a different signal to activate it so this is an example of that if something else in your circuit requires this to be settled and stable nice and high and waiting then you're going to want to have a little timer, you can use an RC network to time it or whatever. You can use a one shot, whichever method you want to just wait, you know, a few microseconds or even a quarter of a second. The user's not going to notice a quarter of a second boot up time. So your clock will start going, the clock will be pulsing, it'll warm up or whatever it has to do. And then this will settle and start rhythmically pulsing properly with the clock after its initial boot up period. And then you can turn on the next part that requires the pulses. But that's how that works. A NAND gate CMOS NAND gate now, CMOS NAND gate monostable, that works as a falling clock signal pulse generator. I just think it's a little cleaner than a delay gate. It's not really. Delay gate is fine, but, you know, this is prettier. So while we both admire its beauty, I'll be seeing you.